made for autistic people, parents and carers of kids on the autism spectrum. This is a different brilliant with Orion Kelly. No two autistic people are the same. Open conversations that inform and engage a better place for autistic An aspect people. podcast focusing on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. Welcome to a different brilliant. Welcome along to A Different Brilliant. I'm your host, Orion Kelly, and I'm autistic. Now, my purpose is to inspire, inform, and entertain you through focusing on the strengths, interests, and aspirations of the autistic community. Open, open, open. open honest, and engaging conversations on autism. A Different, different Brilliant autism. with Orion Kelly. To learn more, catch up on the episodes, or send us a message, like the Aspect page on Facebook, or visit autismspectrum.org.au. On this episode, we are exploring the topic of movement, sport, and autism. My guests are Emma Stanbury and Amy Gruskin. Emma is a star utility mid for A-League Women's Adelaide United FC, and Amy is an occupational therapist at Aspect. Emma, Amy... Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. So happy to be here today. I'm really interested in this topic. For me, I love sport, but also I'm a, a class is a little bit unco. So this is really interesting. Now, Amy, let's start with you. Parents, carers, partners, they often describe the autistic person in their life as, as kind of full of movement. You know, and often it can be quite intense, rigid or dangerous kind of movements, but they might also have a love of dancing and swinging and running and all that kind of stuff. All right, so let's start by unpacking the connection between autism and movement, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. So being an occupational therapist, this is something I hear and support often. People with autism may move their bodies in different ways. Some people may rock, some may repeatedly touch an object, some may jump, some flap, and some are just constantly on the go. We all move throughout our day, whether it be our need to stretch our legs or whether we go to the gym at the end of a long day. But for those on the autism spectrum, movement does look a little different. Some research does state that people on the autism spectrum engage in movement-based activities as it simply feels good to them. It may offer them a way to calm or regulate their emotions and it can support their body awareness and concentration for certain tasks. At other times, movement may be a way to communicate their emotional states to others. Movement in general has many amazing benefits, including physical, emotional and social benefits. Awesome, Amy. Well, let's talk about something that you're involved in. So you're currently involved in a pilot program. It's making dance more inclusive for for kids on the autism spectrum, which is just awesome. This is so cool. Tell us a a bit more about this program and and how it's progressing, how it's going. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm currently involved in a pilot program to make dance more inclusive for children on the autism spectrum, as you mentioned, which is a passion project of mine. In a nutshell, I have worked with a team of therapists, dance academics from both Deakin and Monash University, as well as dance companies, including the Australian Ballet, Block Dance and local dance schools to develop a framework and service that aims to build the skills necessary for participants to engage successfully in a mainstream dance class, all while being supported initially by therapists to learn key and basic skills essential for a dance class. So the program encompasses an initial home visit where we get to know the individuals, a six-week Week dance program where the individuals get to dance and develop skills and then the development of a transition plan and home visit to support transition to a mainstream dance school so it's pretty exciting pretty cool but this was really fueled because on a number of occasions many parents as well as participants had made reference to the desire to engage in leisure-based activities. And I frequently heard statements such as, she desperately wants to go to art camp, but I'm fearful there's no structures in place for her to attend. Or he lacks the required skills to participate constructively in the soccer group. It was clearly apparent that there was a service provision gap in providing a safe and considered environment in which people can join in with their peers and their families to build skills within their chosen 
recreation activity. I was enrolled in dance classes from the age of three years old and it still remains a passion for me. I participated in ballet, jazz, contemporary, Spanish dancing, musical theatre and tap. I was fortunate to dance with the Australian Ballet in productions such as The Nutcracker and Sleeping Beauty and at one stage I seriously considered ballet as a full-time career. Some of the benefits that I gained on my dance journey were discipline, socialization, and creativity, to name but a few. But while I have chosen dance as my pilot program, the ultimate goal and intention is to scale this project to other leisure-based activities and provide this service to many communities and individuals. Good grief. I'm stuffed. I'm just some dude talking to a professional footballer and just an extraordinarily amazing pro ballet dancer. I'm stuffed. I'm shot. I've got nothing to offer here. Uh, now, Emma, out of 10, what, what, how would you rate your dancing, Em? Out of 10, what are we giving ourselves? Uh, look, I think my feet probably look like a ballet dancer's feet. I'm from my soccer boots, but I can't dance. <laughs> okay. Can I just say, my jaw's dropping, Amy. Well, the Australian ballet, oh, oh my goodness, well done to you. That's amazing. Thank yeah, that's you so amazing. much. That's, that's, wow. That's really cool. That is astounding. It was a long time ago, um, but still still something that I, I love to do. That's why, um, that's why she looks 14 on the Zoom. It was a long time ago. Yeah, sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, do look quite young. <laughs> let's talk a bit more specifically, and Amy and Emma, free to open up and uh, both discuss this. I'd love to know how sport, be that dancing, ballet, footy, soccer, whatever, how does sport and exercise specifically benefit autistic people? Amy, you can go first if you want, given that your treatment background as well. Sure, absolutely. I've done quite a lot of research into the benefits of recreation or leisure-based participation. And the research does highlight that there is a need to develop appropriate opportunities for people with disabilities throughout their life course. And the provision of access for people with disabilities to quality leisure opportunities should be addressed or must be addressed on an equal basis of those who do not have a disability. And there are a lot of amazing benefits of recreational participation for those on the autism spectrum or in general for anyone. And that being increased quality of life. So participation in leisure-based activities can provide a sense of accomplishment or achievement. It can support or enhance self-esteem. It can provide joy. It can increase choice and control. And it can also enhance the quality of life of families and staff supporting those on the autism spectrum. Not only does it support quality of life, but it also has enormous benefits for social relationships and acceptance. So participation in leisure-based activities can offer significant opportunities to practice and develop social skills. It encourages social play among our younger people. It provides a way for others to meet and form friendships around mutual interests. It helps people with disabilities learn that people, regardless of abilities, can participate in any given opportunity. And it improves community members' level of awareness and appreciation of capabilities of people with autism. And then, of course, we have our physical and emotional benefits as well. So participation in leisure-based activities can provide an outlet for physical energy. It can develop higher levels of physical fitness and it can improve gross and fine motor skill development. So as you can see, there are so many different benefits and I'm sure Emma will have a lot more to add to that. So may pass it on to Emma. Yeah, I found throughout like my junior years growing up and obviously being myself, I was diagnosed a bit later in life. And so I had quite a few struggles with sport in terms of, you know, I wasn't really good with change or if rules weren't set or or going the way that it's supposed to go, I would be seen as kind of having a bad attitude or especially because I came across as someone as neurotypical. And so that's kind of the negative sides of it. But the positives was when I actually found, you know, with soccer, although I have a lot of arguments with refs because sometimes they're not consistent, (laughs) I've actually found with soccer, it it was a space for me to, when I look at football, I see it as, as art. When I'm out there, I'm seeing all the different angles, all the different lines where I can put a ball through seeing plays before it happens and so my creative side of my brain 
is just in its absolute element. And soccer kind of created that safe space for me when I was younger. And and I find that with autistic people, I feel like when they're younger, sometimes when they get put into sports and, and with neurotypical people, they're seen as too hard to deal with. And that's what also delays the motor skills and the opportunity for them to, to be able to actually potentially be good at a sport. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if we can start to talk more about this, which is what we're doing, go to sporting bodies, create environments that make it safer for people who are younger in autism that want to have a chance to play a sport, whether it's rugby, swimming, dancing, create a safe environment for them to be able to go in, express themselves, learn the skills at a younger age. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more growth and development in the fine motor skills. And I guess it won't be such a stigma around autistic people not being coordinated. It's I, I see that more as an outside thing that's kind of put us into a position where we're not given a chance to learn to, to have that coordination because of the boundaries that people put on us. And You're right, Em. And, and, you know, in fact, it's not a coordination thing. Amy's probably better at this than me, but there's, is it proprioception? There's some sort of study they said where autistic people, let's say catching, can't get the calculation of speed in their head and they push their fingers towards the ball too fast and therefore they don't catch it or there's some sort of study. So it's actually about in your mind the way you judge time and space and all that kind of stuff. I'm probably butchering this Amy but I guess what I'm trying to say is it comes down to practice so for example you know I'm not uncoordinated uh, just because I was you know crap at stuff or I'm inconsistent at stuff I just had to have the time and space to practice it and someone to teach me the way that I can Mm -hmm. I can learn it right and I think for for your point of view Emma there may be opportunities with your reading plays and your way of being able to learn different ways in a teaching coaching in the future the idea of how you are playing at the highest level in this country. And it's not in spite of, it's because you are a gifted, talented, autistic woman. That's just the way it is. So we have to acknowledge the way that people learn and the way they understand. And Amy, one of the big things is inertia, autistic inertia, the, the, the Newton's law, the idea that I might not be in a bad mood, I might want to do something and I have no reason to not, but I can't move to do the thing. That sometimes is the biggest hump getting the autistic child, getting the autistic person into movement, into exercise. I was just going to say that with autistic people is when you have a bad experience on the first time, that can make you not want to do it again. Yep. And so, and then you talk about practice. So if a young kid, they want to want to have a go at, I'm just going to keep using soccer because that's what I know. They want to have a go at soccer and on the first time, maybe they flap about or their energy is inconsistent with others and the coach gets angry at them. They don't want to do it again. And so then they don't have that chance to practice to get better with those motor skills. And so that's what I'm finding is is the biggest issue and why you find most autistic people, I guess, going more towards the arts and something where it doesn't really involve other people. Yes, Whereas when yes. you're around other people, well, that's such an opportunity to yes. to grow and have fun. And-, and it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a lost talent. Amy, what did you want to add to this? Yeah, I was just going to say that I am um, with both of you. I, I totally agree with your thoughts around this area. And I have heard from a number of parents, you know, leading up to this program, but they can't move or they, they're not coordinated and they won't be able to learn, you know, the dance moves as they should. And I guess it's a total misconception because movement is movement that can be developed or it can be participated in in any way shape or form it's really a a form or a medium to be creative to express themselves and part of this program it's been fantastic you know watching our participants go through that process and us as therapists um, develop different supports and different strategies so that these individuals can engage in the way that they need to and, and want to engage and I think you mentioned that before it's around each person's learning style we all learn very differently and when we can match that you know the possibilities are are endless 100 agree so I, have, I have a question amy what do you find is the average age bracket that you find autistic kids coming to you to, to actually want to start learning to dance because i know with my football i started you know you said you started ballet at three years old did you say i started my yes. football at three yeah i started my football when i was very young i was kicking a ball i was doing stuff and so i guess my question is what age do you find someone that isn't neurotypical is wanting to finally come to sport and is that potentially what is delaying the motor skills and all those kind of things so that's a great question I think the research is still 
inconclusive, but from what I have found, participants and parents and their families' perception and level of confidence to engage or access in these leisure-based activities is quite low. A lot of parents have said, oh, I don't think they're quite ready or we're not ready to, to engage or go down that route. So I do think, although people on the spectrum do want to access or learn and develop these skills are not coming forward as early as they would have liked. Actually, one of the participants part of my program at the moment had said to me last week during group that um, she's always wanted to learn ballet and she's actually taught herself using YouTube clips but never had the opportunity to go to a class or to pursue that leisure-based hobby and this particular individual is eight years old so she is fairly young but is in a mainstream school and I assume is seeing some of her peers as well join all of these extracurricular based activities but due to parental confidence and her confidence has has not had that same opportunity. I've lost total control. Emma's taken over. (laughs) You know what, Emma? (laughs) Can I just answer as a dad of an autistic son, what Amy said is correct. There is no chance at three there was any inclusive programs where we could have got him anywhere near sports, please. Swimming, footy, soccer, basketball, whatever, cricket. There's absolutely no chance. And we play in the backyard. And now he's eight. It's still hard to get the kid. Like, it, I try to get him going to swimming lessons. It's like two people in the whole lesson, and every one week out of a month, I might get him there. So it's, inclusive is not even remotely close to reality in Australian sports. That's my opinion, and we're going to talk about that. In all seriousness, can I say that was a, that was a bloody great question, and I'm really glad Amy got the chance to talk about that. It puts it, uh, you know, on our trajectory to talking about more inclusive stuff. But first, just a quick one on diagnosis and disclosure. I get asked all the time, Emma, about disclosure to employers, because obviously being an adult, people are so scared of disclosure to unis and to employers because they just don't know. You know, they just don't know. Tell us your experience. What was your experience? Obviously, you were diagnosed late, but disclosing that to not only a fan base, to an employer, to a league. Talk us through that experience and, and how it felt, how it went. Yeah, so I was diagnosed early 20s. I I had known since I was a kid, but I went and did the proper full assessment when I was 21. And prior to this year, I had told previous coaches just them and I asked them to keep it between us because I could pass as neurotypical and mask very well. And I would kind of tell them things that would I would need to help me and I guess also autism wasn't as spoken about even 10 years ago. I feel like it, everything's moving a lot more progressively, especially the past two, three years. So this year, the reason why I decided to, I guess, come out, and it sounds funny because I'm a gay person as well, and I came out a long time ago, and I felt more nervous about speaking openly about my autism. But the reason why I felt I needed to is because I haven't had a good experience. I haven't, even when I have told people previously. And that's not because of me. And it's taken me a long time to understand that. I always thought I was the problem. And it's not necessarily that they're the problem either. It's just there's not an understanding. And I mean a true understanding. It's easy to say to someone, yep, I'm autistic. But for some reason, especially when you can present as neurotypical, they almost expect from you to be neurotypical and they don't understand the spectrum is so big. And for me on the spectrum, my emotions, oh my gosh, I can't handle my emotions, loud sounds, all those kind of things. And, and they're actually quite a big thing with soccer, especially because I'm so passionate about it. My heart's on the line with football. So there's been times where, you know, I'll have a meltdown mid session because I can't regulate and control my emotions. And previously that's been seen as a poor attitude or putting myself above the team and, And so I thought, you know, I really need to speak out about this because there's probably other girls and boys that are going through similar situations. And until coaches, staff, people truly understand, it's always going to hold myself back and other autistic people back because we're trying so hard in the moment with football. There's so much going through my brain. There's so much. And then you've got your coach's instructions. And then on top of that, you've got your peers around you and you're trying to be the best version of you. And I thought, how can I be the best version of me? And I thought, I just want to rip the mask off. If I have a meltdown, I have a meltdown. I want them to understand, you know, that's just Chook. 
she needs a moment, she needs to regulate, she needs a bit of space. And I found it was it was really supportive and a big change for me, Adelaide. I had one of the best seasons in W League. I had coaches coming up to me prior to training sessions when certain things were getting changed and explained to me this is what's going to happen this session. And it just gave me more time to, I guess, process. And it was very nerve-wracking, but it is so important because, like I said, I think I want the world to understand we want to be our best selves. And until other people can understand truly, that's what's holding us back, Yeah, if that makes and, sense. And a, a massive shout-out to... Adelaide United FC because they're one out. There's a lot of a lot of organisations that do not do what this organisation has done for you, and I just think it's worth them getting a shout out. So well done, guys. You know the the fact of the matter is, Emma, I can tell you, not only for kids, it's disclosing or not being autistic can ruin their opportunity to have a good experience as a player on a team, as a kid or an adult, and it can also ruin careers. So disclosure is a really tricky situation, and people like yourself are certainly helping it. You you did talk about being inclusive. I know this is a big passion of yours, making sports, wider sporting bodies more inclusive. Okay, so what do you see as the key benefits for fostering a more inclusive sporting industry? I spoke to one of the people on the board. His name's Ian. He's he's a fantastic guy. And I believe in the AFL, they've actually started implementing this. There's a specific room, like one of the corporate boxes, where they're, they've made it autism friendly. So it's it's quiet. You know, I struggle with them. There's times where someone will get tripped in front of me and the ref runs past me and blows the whistle really loud in my ear and I just go, oh! Yeah, to make it more inclusive, I think there needs to be conversations within each sporting club and it's not hard. Just a room that allows potentially a separate entrance or if they come earlier, headphones, whatever it is, Again, the spectrum's so big and some people are fine with the sounds, but that room is, is specifically for people to be able to come and feel safe, enjoy the game and, and be able to be a part of something that they thought they would be able to be a part of before. That's just one step into a positive direction. And coaching must be an issue, right? If you're an autistic person, child or adult, the relationship with the coach and, and them understanding where you're coming from, that must be a big thing. It can really make or break your ability to get on the park right I mean, they've got to understand what they're what they're dealing with it obviously every person's different but there must be some sort of knowledge base that we can provide coaches and, and bodies because like you said it's okay to have a quiet room but then if you get on the field and you just act like a normal autistic person and they go you can't act like that because that's not acceptable to hr or neurotypical people then you're, you're gone you're finished right it's happened to me. I've had a meltdown after a game. I tried to leave. This is a bit raw, a bit real, but I, I tried to leave. I tried to get to my car because I was just, I wasn't good. I could feel the meltdown coming um, and I had a teammate and they were they were trying to do the right thing. They were trying to check on me and I just said, please, please, I need, I need to get out. I, and before I knew it, I'm having a meltdown. A door was open and, and some fans saw and a coach saw it. And I got benched for three weeks for this because it wasn't professional and it wasn't how I should be acting in front of others. And I tried to explain, you know, I can't control this and I tried to do the right thing. And so after reflecting on that moment, I have a mindset coach, his name's Frankie. And when I look at my women's team and I look at some other sporting, I see the coaching staff, yep. I see the physio, yep. But where is the person that's there for players' mental health yep. whether it's autism depression all those kind of things where's the support stuff so where's someone that knows emma had autism we've lost today she probably hasn't played really well we know that she's not good with her emotions how can we find someone that might grab her and walk her to a safer spot after but those things aren't implemented and and that's something that can be implemented yeah but yeah this is where i go back to understanding people yeah. they think they understand but they don't fully understand yeah. can i, I chime yeah. in there? yeah go go amy Sorry. i think it's it's really tricky and i agree with you the level of awareness or understanding is just not there Yet, but I do think, and as you mentioned, Emma, you know, we always say when you've met one person on the spectrum, you've met one person on the spectrum. Everybody presents so differently and has their own needs, preferences and and challenges. And I think, you know, where there's a big gap is developing the confidence to advocate for yep. yourself and the understanding of those coaches or those teachers or the fans to 
be able to adapt and listen to, you know, what you need and be able to then implement them in practice because it, it's tricky to find that generalized strategy that's going to meet the needs of, of everybody. But if that awareness is, is greater and if people are more accepting of making those those changes, hopefully we'll see a little bit more more success. Absolutely. What an amazing chat. I've really enjoyed this. It's such fantastic perspectives. Emma and Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having me, Ryan. <laughs> My guests on this episode were Emma Stanbury and Amy Gruskin. A Different Brilliant with Orion Kelly. Seriously, I want to thank you so much for listening to A Different Brilliant. We really appreciate it. Now, if this episode has resonated with you, I'd love it if you would share it with your family and friends so we can reach more people. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, just like the Aspect page on Facebook or visit autismspectrum.org.au. You're also welcome to send me a message if you want. Go to my website, orionkelly.com.au. A Different Brilliant is an Aspect podcast. Executive producers are Lisa Cassidy, Dr. Tom Tutton and Julie Fenwick. I'm Orion Kelly. Thanks for listening to A Different Brilliant with Orion Kelly, an Aspect podcast on the strengths, interests and aspirations of the autistic community. Our door is open anytime. So like the Aspect page on Facebook or visit autismspectrum.org.au. My aim, make the world a better place for autistic people.